In the previous video, we created a new file location for the data we're preparing to collect. In this video, we'll continue our preparation for data collection with the next two steps in the basic instructions. Number three, properly placing our NMR sample into the magnetic field. And number four, optional spinning of the NMR tube inside the probe. This 4.7 family style magnet is our most dangerous magnet in terms of straight field. This pine accordion fence sits on the five gauss line, which is also marked with marking masking tape on the floor around the magnet. Don't bring anything magnetic, electronic, or metallic into the magnetic field. To insert the sample, number three on the instruction list, we'll need a depth measure and we'll need a spinner. There's a marking here for five millimeter outer diameter NMR tubes. That is the size you should be using. This black line marks where the coil is located inside the instrument. We have a QMP probe inside this magnet. It has two coils, an outer coil doubly tuned to proton and deuterium, and an inner coil for the variable detection of carbon, phosphorus, or fluorine. We see two different markings on the depth measure that are centered the same for the two different coils. Your sample should be both above and below the black markings, or in other words, the bottom of the glass tube and the meniscus at the top of the solution should be above and below the black markings on the coil. Otherwise, it will be hard to compensate for the magnetic field inhomogeneities caused by the jump in magnetic susceptibility at the different liquid air and liquid solid interfaces. This will reduce the resolution and sensitivity of your NMR spectrum. First, I check that the spinner is clean. Since all NMR tubes arrive at the NMR lab thoroughly cleaned on the outside of the tube, this should not be a problem. However, it only takes one individual one time to arrive with a dirty tube, and you'll see this on the inside of the spinner. We have cotton swabs on the desktops to remove crud from the inside of the spinner before you put it into the magnet. This reduces downtime on the spectrometer, keeps the instrumentation in good condition, and prevents your sample from having spinning problems. If the glass sample tube sits too low, it may hit the probe and break. The spinner certainly won't sit in the right place for sample spinning. If it's placed too high, the solution might not reach the detector. And then we're doing an NMR experiment on air. So you do want to make sure that the tube is correctly placed into the spinner. I place the depth measure on the table. The spinner only fits into it in one direction. The sample volume should be greater than 400 microliters, so the sample height is about two and a half to three fingers. Under conditions of sufficient sample volume, all I do is slide the sample down to the bottom with the cap side up. Next, leave the depth measure behind. We have cloths around for wiping the tubes and the spinners in order to remove finger grease. If I touch my eyeglass lens, I leave a fingerprint that makes it difficult for me to see through my lens. When you touch the spinner, the fingerprint you leave behind can interfere with the optical eye's detection of the spinning frequency. And dust likes to stick to accumulated grease inside, blocking the tiny air holes used to spin the sample. It's much easier for you to wipe it now than for us to have downtime on the spectrometer to remove the probe and the shim stack from the magnet to clean it from inside. When I take the sample, I don't want to hold it by the spinner, I just wipe my fingerprints off of it. Also, I don't want to hold it by the cap, the tube might fall. So hold it by the assembly here. We're now on step 3C of the instructions. Notice in the instructions, the buttons in the picture have labels. You can use that to figure out the location of the button on this BSMS keyboard. On the actual buttons that we use the most, the labels have been rubbed off for frequent, frequent use. Press the lift button. This is the gray button in the upper left corner. The green light turns on. It takes a moment before we can hear or feel the lift air. So we can take our time to slowly and calmly walk to the magnet. Make sure you've removed your watch and emptied your pockets before you em enter into the five gauss line. Once you can hear and feel the lift air, then it's safe to place the NMR tube with the spinner onto the cushion of air and let go without it crashing down. I can feel the lift air. I gently, face, I gently place the assembly on top and click the lift button once again. 
The sample is sitting on a cushion of air. The green light is now off after pushing the lift button. As the lift air is turned off, the pressure is slowly lowered and the sample is gently placed into the coil at the center of the magnet. When the spectrometer recognizes that the sample is correctly positioned, the red missing light will change to green down. We now go to step number four of the instructions, which is optional. There's another button here labeled spin on off. To spin the sample, I press the button and the green light will turn on. Air is blowing through tiny holes underneath the spinner in the room temperature shim stack. This causes the spinner to rotate around the z-axis. An optical eye can detect the spinning frequency by the black and white markings on the spinner. When we spin in this way, any magnetic field in homogeneity is along the x-axis or along the y-axis are averaged out over every full rotation. Thus, instead of trying to correct for spatial differences in the external magnetic field, we just smear them out. That simplifies our magnetic field corrections to a single axis along Z. For standard pulse acquire experiments on the 200 or 300 megahertz spectrometers, we usually spin. The spin rate we use is 20 hertz. If we were to spin more slowly, we wouldn't average the X and Y axes. If we were to spin the sample too rapidly, the vortex created in the center of the solution would make the situation worse than not spinning at all. However, there are many instances where we choose not to spin. For example, if we're running 2D spectra or NOE measurements, or working with pulsed field gradients, or at higher fields, or using J. Young tubes, then we just skip the spin option and we'll just use what is called shimming to correct for field inhomogeneities along the X or Y axes. Did you know that, notice the spin button light? It was blinking and then it stopped blinking. The blinking light tells us that the spin button was activated, but the measured spin rate differed from what we requested by more than plus or minus one hertz. To see what spinning frequency we requested, we can push this middle button labeled spin rate. It says 20 and the units are in hertz, meaning that we requested 20 rotations per second. In order to see the actual spinning rate, we'll use this orange button, which is labeled second. In order to activate the second function of the spin rate button, the function written below the button, which is spin measure. Here in red, it tells us on the left that we requested 20 hertz spinning for the sample. And here on the right, it tells us that the actual spinning rate is 20 hertz. Since the actual spinning rate matches the requested spinning rate, Within plus or minus one hertz, the green light on the spin button is lit and not blinking. Here, it's plus or minus 20 hertz, and so the spin rate button is blinking. To deactivate the spin rate spin measure button, we press standby here at the bottom middle. In the next video, we'll learn about the how and why of keeping our external magnetic field invariable and homogeneous during our NMR experiment, or in NMR jargon, Lock and chill.